Thank you. So let me start by thanking the organizers for this invitation in this beautiful place. And uh, finally realizing my acte manqué in September of 2001 when I was supposed to visit here and then you know what happened. And I couldn't, so I'm very happy to be able to now. Okay, so this talk will be about uh, combinatorics mainly, but also some asymptotics. So I think I'm still within the, uh, the limits of, uh, of a conference. And it will uh, be about uh, the triangular lattice version of a six vertex model, basically. So I'll start, of course, by uh, reminding you of a few facts about alternating sign matrices, six vertex models, and uh, integrability, and the role played by integrability. And when, then we'll go over to the triangular lattice version. So uh, I apologize to Igor for uh, using acronyms. Uh, so this is domain wall boundary conditions. And this is, well, the next thing to alternating sign matrices. So I'll let you guess. OK, it could have been AST, which would have been alternating sign tensors, right? Mm -hmm. But it's still matrices, clearly. So what can alternate? No idea? Phase, alternating phase matrices, right? Signs, phases. OK. So I'll show you what these things are. So it's a combinatorial object, but we are going to be able to count. And uh, then for something completely different, we are going to look at the domino tilings of what I call the holy square, holy Aztec square. And holy has an E here, right? So nothing <laughs> religious here. OK. And uh, this is the acronym that goes with it, HASDT, right? So holy Aztec square domino tiling. Sorry about that. And there will be a correspondence, and I'll show you how, to, how the proof goes. And then we'll uh, consider more of these uh, objects, related triangular eyes, and uh, I will show you some combinatorial conjectures. So I hope somebody will pick up on that. And finally, uh, I'll uh, show you what a large APM looks like and uh, uh, show you some results, some recent results on the Arctic phenomenon for those objects. OK. So uh, just to, uh, to summarize this thing, uh, it's what I'm going to explain to you here is really a tale of two sequences. So look at them. And if anybody recognizes something, uh, I'll be happy to. Uh, OK, so there's a 23. I like 23. I'll show you 23 in many of these guises. All right, so uh, I start with the, st the basics, right? So these uh, alternating sign matrices come really from the square i. So it's really square i's, right, H2O, uh, in a lattice where the oxygen ions are on, on a square lattice uh, vertices, and then the hydrogens are along edges, and they form these uh, these molecules, right? So uh, uh, two hydrogen ions have the tendency of being closer to an oxygen, right? So you can uh, model that with uh, dipolar momenta, which are just arrows that point, uh, you know, in the right direction. And of course, this condition that two hydrogens are always closer to one oxygen gives you a rise to the so-called ice rule, and it comes from there. So. But at each vertex, the number of incoming arrows, it's uh, the number of outgoing arrows, right? So in square lattice, it will be two, two incoming, two outgoing, giving rise to six possibilities, which are the six vertices of the six vertex. Then there's the question of the domain or boundary conditions. So we are going to impose boundary condition on, on the square grid that force domain walls. So a domain wall in, in physics is just a wall where uh, some variable changes value, right? So here, if you follow a, an horizontal arrow in this direction, you want it to be reversed at some point, right? So the best way of, of arranging for that is to have a boundary condition which is opposite on the other side, OK? So that's the explanation for this domain wall. OK, so this is a, a, a sample uh, uh, configuration of a six vertex model with all these uh, ice rules, so no, nothing new here. Here are the six vertices. Usually, one attaches to them Boltzmann weights, right, in such a way that uh, they're invariant under reversal of arrows. You don't have to, but it's, it's convenient. 
and there's another way of uh, of I have seen we've seen that way already in 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 some talks before maybe not in the same direction but uh, same idea of replacing the configurations of arrows by configurations of osculating paths so called osculating paths where you're basically going to have red paths uh, within your domain uh, with uh, the fact that they are allowed to kiss so my paths are going to be going from north west to southeast, which is yet another choice than those you've seen before. Now, the connection with alternating sign matrices is that there's a very simple property of those vertices here. So they're called vertices because they're vertices of a lattice, right? So at each vertex, you see that either the arrows are transmitted, right? So if they were arriving from the left, they just continue horizontally and vertically also, or they're very reflected. The two last guys are reflected. So you're going to put a zero on your vertex whenever it's transmitter, right? And when it's reflector, there would be a one and a minus one with an obvious rule that if you start entering here, then it's a one, but if you start outgoing, then it's a minus one. Okay? So now, of course, you can, uh, instead of drawing these arrow configurations, you can draw these ASMs, right? So here is a, an example. This is the arrow configuration. This is the um, osculating path configuration and this is the alternating sign matrix. So whenever you have a reflector vertex you may have a one or a minus one and they alternate in the right way. Any questions? Okay, that should be really standard. So the ASM world is quite big so this is only a small piece of the ASM world. So okay, so we've already seen uh, that uh, six vertex with domain wall boundary conditions was in this world but there's uh, also other acronyms Okay, so this one is the toughest one. Totally symmetric, self-complementary plane partitions. Okay, so basically rhombus stylings of a regular hexagon of size 2n, if n is this size here, right, size 2n, which has all the symmetries of the hexagon, right? So the fundamental domain is just 1 12. Okay, you count them, you find the same number as the number of ISMs. And here is, I, I draw your attention to, to this because we are going to generalize this. Actually, we are going to generalize this this and this. So this is uh, called descending plane partitions. So originally it was defined in a much uh, less visual way, but this is after many transformations. Uh, Kratenthaler came up with this uh, formulation, which is rhombus stylings of a quasi hexagon. It's not quite a uh, quasi regular hexagon. It's not quite regular because it has size n, n plus 2, n, n plus 2, etc. Right? which gives rise uh, the for the possibility of having a hole in the middle. So it's a holy hexagon. Okay? And moreover, you impose a, 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 a symmetry by, by 2 pi over 3 rotation. Okay? So these are tiling configurations of this holy hexagon with 2 pi over 3 uh, rotational symmetry. Okay? So all those guys are counted by this number. So all these are proved, right? But there is no bijection. So we are in no bijection land. So now there's this new paper uh, of Ilse Fischer and collaborator who claim to have uh, some bijection, I believe, between uh, DPP and ISM, I think. And well, the question is, what do you mean by bijection? And there are some, OK, I don't want to. Uh, uh, anyway, I'm not interested in those bijections. I, I'm going to show you that somehow the right way of thinking of those objects is algebraic rather than bi bijective. Okay, algebraic. And where does the algebra uh, come from? It comes from integrability. So we, uh, very generally, uh, vertex models uh, can be uh, described uh, using what's called an R operator, which usually comes from a uh, representation theory of some quantum algebra, but okay, let's call it R operator. And uh, the picture is like this. You have uh, an horizontal vector space and a vertical vector space, which are, ha have finite dimension, let's say, and therefore indexed by a finite number of labels, and we can choose those labels to be arrows, for instance, in the case of dimension two. Okay, and that would be my six vertex model. Right? And then the entries, uh, uh, so this is a matrix of, 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 of size uh, uh, 2 f times 2, which is 4 by 4, right? Because it goes from the tensor product of these two spaces, V1 tensor V2, to the tensor product of these two spaces, V2 tensor V1, right? So it has a priori 16 entries, and in the case of a six vertex model, only six non-zero entries are going to happen, and they correspond to exactly these six objects and the 
actual air matrix elements are going to be these numbers A, B, C, which are the Boltzmann weights, that is the weights you attach to the vertices. Okay? All right, so integrability is basically this, uh, this relation, uh, which tells you uh, that if you have a, a case of uh, three intersections between three lines, you can move uh, freely uh, any line above, uh, above the intersection of the other two. Okay? And the result is an operator, right, from V1 tensor V2 tensor V3 to V3 tensor V2 tensor V1, in both cases, and the operator is going to be the same. Okay? So that's the, the condition of uh, uh, Young-Baxter. Okay? So um, one can show that for this particular choice, which is called the trigonometric uh, R matrix for UQSL2, uh, uh, so this choice here, in which um, I have an extra um, a parameter living on the lines that carry the vector spaces, right? So these are complex parameters, Z1, Z2, Z3, called usually spectral parameters. And now each weight is going to depend on the parameters carried by the two incoming uh, edges, right? So. A, B, and C are functions of Z and W, if Z and W are the two parameters uh, appearing in the crossing of the two lines. Okay? Now there's this, uh, this parameter Q, which is called the quantum parameter, uh, which tells you basically which, which, which model you're looking at. Okay. So, what is triangular ice? Well, I'm, I'm just going to play the same game on the triangular lattice, which is here, but it, this is hard to draw, so I will draw this. Okay? No? Now, by doing this, of course, I, 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 I make uh, special the, the fact that I'm going to work on a square lattice, right? And this will be very important for us. Now, the ice rule is now that you have exactly three incoming and three outgoing vert uh, edges at each vertex. Right? So you're going to decorate all the edges with arrows, right? and then you have this condition everywhere. So the first question which arises is, what kind of boundary conditions, what kind of domains am I going to look at? But first, uh, let me show you uh, the 20 vertices this gives rise to. Okay, so why 20? And because it's, uh, you, you have uh, a priori six choices of arrows, but uh, of course uh, uh, three of them are entering and three of them are outgoing, and I believe this is 20. Yeah, it should be 20. And uh, these are the 20 vertices, right? So in pretty much the same way as for the six vertex, you have an osculating path formulation, and my paths are also going to go from the north, uh, west to the southeast, right? And so uh, I would say the, the, the new feature in this model compared to, uh, to the six vertex is, is really this guy, right? Is the fact that there are still kissing point or uh, uh, osculating points between the paths, but you can have a triple click kissing. So you know, it's a very French system, right? <laughs> okay. So uh, here you have uh, osculating Schroeder paths. Schroeder just means that instead of having just two types of steps, horizontal and vertical, you also have diagonal steps. And it's called Schroeder and not Mutskin because the length of the diagonal is not the same. Okay, there is a little thing here. It's called Schroeder. Okay, domain uh, boundary conditions now. So the, the most natural way of, of enforcing some, some, uh, some reflections of, of arrows somewhere is to actually impose that all the horizontal arrows enter and uh, horizontally and vertically exit, right? And then the diagonal somehow are going to uh, reinforce that, right? So here the diagonal enters, here the diagonal enters as well, and here diagonal exits and diagonal exits. So the first problem you can see here is that uh, this guy is not clear whether it's, it's part of the left or part of the top, right? So I have two choices. So I will call them one and two, okay? And so you see here I circled the, uh, the guys uh, in question, okay? So in terms of paths, it means that I have a family of paths that all enter here, right? And all exit there. Okay, and here same thing, but except that I don't enter on this diagonal and I don't exit on that diagonal. Okay, so slightly different. Now, uh, you might think these two are, look very much the same. Actually, they are the same. If you rotate by, um, by pi and change the, I mean, 
change the orientation, that like they have to be changed, you will see that there's bijection. So in this case, there's a real bijection. So we can uh, content ourselves with looking at one of these two, it will be the same. Now, you can choose more boundary conditions, which will have an effect also of reflecting. And this is another one. So it's much easier to look at it in terms of paths. Uh, this is basically the same condition as for six vertex model, right? But now we've, we've those empty diagonal uh, entrances here and e empty diagonal exits there, right? Okay, so it's a bit more relaxed than the other one, which is very crowded. Can you go back? Sure. So this is very crowded, as you see. Everybody is occupied here and everybody is occupied here and there it's more relaxed. Only one Every other guy is occupied here and occupied here, and you have less paths, right? So more configurations. Okay, and so now you count by using uh, some transfer matrix some, uh, formulation, for instance, and you find those two sequences I was advertising before. Okay, so that's domain rule one, two, that's domain rule three. Okay, so far so good. All right, so just to show you, uh, right? So these are the 23 uh, domain rule one. Uh, boundary conditions for this 20 vertex model. Okay. All right, so now alternating phase matrices, how are we going to do that? Well, uh, I hope you didn't forget already that the way alternating side matrices were constructed starting from six vertex configurations were by uh, deciding whether a vertex was transmitting or reflecting, right? So here the same thing, but we have three directions. So let's look at a direction and decide if it's Transmitting or reflecting, right? So for each direction, whenever it's transmitter, I will attach a zero. And when it's reflector, a one or a minus one, you with the same rules as, as before, right? So a priori, I'm going to have now triples of integers, which can take the value zero, one, and minus one, right? Because one for each direction, okay? So that's why I, co I started calling them alternating sign tensors, because it's, it's really, it has three entries in each uh, matrix element, right? But these entries are, are, are related by the ice rule. The ice rule tells me that the sum of the three entries should be zero. So that reduces uh, their number, right? And actually, uh, it leaves you with only seven possibilities, right? Everybody zero, or one, one, and one minus one in various places, right? And so when there's one, one, and one minus one in various places, it's, it's, it's bijectively equivalent to the six roots of unity, okay? So now we are going to have matrices with elements six roots of unities and zero, okay? So that's these alternating phase matrices. And the alternation will come from these rules and from the boundary conditions, okay? So here is the example, for instance, if I have this vertex, right? I decompose into horizontal, vertical, diagonal. So it's reflector in both these directions, transmitter in this one. So the, 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 the triple will be 0, 1, minus 1, and it will correspond to one of those roots of unity. So here is the dictionary. Uh, so for eight vertices which are fully transmitting, uh, I will get 0, so I don't draw them. And for the re remaining 12 reflector vertices, Okay, so in, in terms of paths, a reflector vertex is, is a vertex where the one of the paths at least makes a turn, right? It means a transmitted path is a path that goes straight, okay? So it should be kind of obvious. And this is the assignment of, of, uh, of uh, cubic roots of unity. So instead of writing them as cubic roots, I, I write them as uh, a sine times, uh, so six roots, I write them as a sine times cubic root, right? Yes? Is there a projective uh, the equivalent to six roots of unity, but it's also projective equivalent to any other set of size six? So I, I, I agree. I agree. Well, it's because the alternating conditions, but I mean, you have to impose those alternating conditions, right? Right. So they appear more natural? Kind of more natural, yeah. You could also use roots of SLT. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, you know, whatever. Whatever suits you best, right? Okay, it won't change anything to the counting. <laughs> All right, so here is an example, right? So for type one, type two, type three, uh, of course you can do this for all the types. All right, so a small theorem, which is really easy to prove, it is all ASMs are APMs, okay? So why? Well, choose your favorite ASM, right? Then there's a certain uh, arrow configurations on the underlying square lattice, right? 
and now you want to put diagonals in there. Well, if you've chosen boundaries, you just put diagonals that go straight because they have no reflections, right? So no reflective vertices diagonally, that will give you the alternating side matrices. Yes? If you give me an ATM, how can I check the ATM without doing the translation? Is there a direction? That's hard. That's hard. But you can do very quick checks, like sum of entries, sum, sum along a diagonal, uh, sum along verticals, etc. So there are many checks that allow to rule them out, at least. But there's no easy characterization? It's not easy. No. No. I, I mean, I don't know any easy way. Yeah. OK, so now I change completely subject. And I, I introduce you to this holy square, holy Aztec square. So you probably all know about the Aztec diamond, right? Yes? Yes? OK. So imagine an Aztec diamond in which I kind of bumped a, bit, a little bit, right? I, I, I had an accident with an, acc uh, with a, an Aztec diamond. So I, I pushed this thing here. So it went down by one step. So it went all the way down. And then I pushed it here. And it went all the, all the way to the left. OK? So it's not quite an Aztec square, but almost. But now for this thing to be tileable, you have to remove a odd number of, uh, of, of, of squares. So the, the smallest thing with an odd number of squares mm -hmm. that works and is nice is this cross. OK? And now, just so here you see, what, what I'm trying is to imitate what happened with descending plane partitions, where I had a quasi-regular hexagon with a hole in the middle and some symmetry, right? So now I have a quasi-regular Aztec square uh, with a hole in the middle. And I will impose the natural symmetry of a problem, which is uh, 2 pi over 4 rotations now, quarter turn, right? So quarter turn symmetric domino tilings of a holy Aztec square. That's what we are going to look at, OK? Don't ask me why, because uh, the answer will come. All right, so uh, OK, so how do you count those configurations? Well, you, you concentrate on a fundamental domain, and you look at what goes on, uh, and, and so especially at the, at the boundary of tiles. OK, and then uh, you think a little more. And uh, you can do this with uh, uh, non-intersecting paths. So these paths are the same Schroeder paths as in the other problem, right? These are paths that can go straight, uh, vertically, or diagonally, right? With the same uh, length, OK? And there's a, a, a bijection between tilings and paths, we, which is that uh, you, you first bicolor the, the, the underlying square lattice, and your dominoes are two by one. So uh, according to what the color is, uh, you will uh, either cross the domino by a diagonal, or leave it blank, or have a vertical or an horizontal. Okay, So there's a, a dictionary between the four configurations of dominoes, which are bicolored, and the four configurations of path edges, which are horizontal, vertical, diagonal, or empty. OK? All right. So you get these sorts of pictures. And the fact that you have a, a rotational invariance of 2 pi over 4 means that the positions of the paths here are the same as the positions of the paths here, uh, up to a shift of 1, which is due to the presence of a hole. OK? So this is very easy to, uh, to count. And here is the answer. So it's just the determinant of a finite truncation of an infinite matrix, which I write with this generating function. OK? So the coefficient of ZIWJ in the formal uh, series expansion of this func rational function is going to be the AIJ element of this matrix. This is generating the identity, and this is another matrix, right? So it's really the determinant of, an I of the identity plus a matrix, which you can uh, expand by cauchy binet right, as a sum over diagonal minors. And then those diagonal minors, you can interpret thanks to gesell vieno as uh, partition functions for paths, whose starting and end points are the same, at the same positions. right? So that's, that's how this, this works. OK, so here is the, the example. How do I get 23? Well, it's the case n equals 3. Uh, OK, I didn't say yet, but uh, there will be 23 uh, 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 tilings of uh, holy Aztec diamond of size 3, right? And it's just the identity plus this matrix, which is generated by that. And you compute this determinant. You find 23. And now let me show you the 23 guys, OK? So for some reason, it, it looks bizarre, but, uh, but the, the, the picture is right. It's, it's just an effect of, uh, 
uh, I don't know, it, it looks twisted. Anyway, so I, I, I drew for you some fundamental domain and also the, the paths corresponding to it. So you see the expansion of identity plus matrix, uh, the determinant of identity plus matrix, actually doesn't fix the number of rows and columns, right? It sums over them. So it means that in terms of paths, I will have configurations with zero path, one path, two paths, and uh, that's it here. Okay? All right. So we have a, a formula for, yeah, the, and here I'm, I'm showing you the 23 other guys, right? So as 23 equals 23, uh, there must be a bijection, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good. So the correspondence now, I didn't even state it, but, but the, the correspondence is that, of course, uh, these two sequences are going to be the same, okay? So the um, configuration, the number of configurations with domain world boundary conditions one and two or two of the 20 vertex models or the APMs, right, are counted by the same numbers as the uh, domino tilings of uh, quarter turn symmetric uh, only Aztec square. Okay, all right. Okay, so um, to show that we already computed the, 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 the number uh, of, uh, of tilings, so let's, let's turn now to the 20 vertex. So what we're going to do with the 20 vertex is first uh, use integrable weights. Okay, so cook up integrable, uh, an integrable system uh, for which the 20 vertex will be the configurations. Okay, then deform the line arrangement of the 20 vertex into the line arrangement that produces the 6 vertex, right? And then use 6 vertex result. Okay, so that's the program. So quickly, let me show you how to do this. So, um, Actually, the, the, the best way of dealing with a triangular lattice is to actually go to a, an, an even more complicated case, which is called the Kagome lattice. Okay? So Kagome lattice is just obtained by taking my original lattice and moving all the diagonals uh, slightly, right? So move, move them slightly uh, down in this case. Okay? So that creates all these little triangles, right? But the neat thing is that now I have a, a proper intersections between lines with two lines instead of having triple intersections, okay? So just like in the six vertex case, I can put spectral parameters along each type of line. So I have Z's, W's, and T's, okay? And then I will, of course, demand that uh, the, the, the R matrices that I use to define this model are going to obey the Young-Baxter equation. Why? Because I want to be able to move around these diagonal edges Right, uh, lines. In particular, the guy obtained when the diagonal line is, is right on top of the intersection of the other two will be part of the same, of the same set of, of models, right? It's just one version of a model in which I have used Young-Baxter to push the guy along, right? And it will allow me to, to move them even more than that. So, okay, so first thing is why is it called Kagome, this lattice? And it's not the name of a, of, of a, of a Japanese uh, physicist. Well, this is all comes from physics, so it could have been a physicist. But it comes from uh, kagome in uh, Japanese, which means basket and hole. So it's, a, it's an entire art. It's the art of making baskets. And uh, this is a particular uh, pattern that you find in this basket. Okay, so much for kagome. Now here is a kagome, uh, a lattice of kagome, which I found in a grocery store in Kyoto, <laughs> right? So it's, it says kagome on it and it forms a lattice, so I think it, it qualifies, mm -hmm. right? And uh, there is a reason why I'm showing you this, but I'm not telling you now. <laughs> okay, so back to uh, science. Um, so this is my triangular lattice, and this is the way I'm going to define the Boltzmann weights I want to use here. I'm going to therefore go over to the Kagome case, and here I have indicated three sublattices, right? Lat sublattice one, sublattice two, sublattice three, which has, are three square sublattices, on which I will use, on each of them, I'll use Boltzmann weights of a six vertex model. Okay, so I do that. So these are my three six vertex models, right, corresponding to the sublattices one, two, three, right? I can uh, choose their weights, uh, give them names like this. And then the 20 vertex weights, they're going to be defined 
by sums over inner triangle configurations on the Kagome lattice that correspond to the same outer configuration. Okay, so I fix the outer uh, arrows and three must enter, three must exit, just like here. Huh? And then I sum over all possibilities of putting inner arrows. So in this case, there's two, but if I had moved my, my edge above here, there would be only one. And this identity is actually the Young-Baxter equation. Okay, it's the Young-Baxter equation for the three R matrices of one, two, three uh, at work. Okay. So in this way, I can define Boltzmann Wayne's W for, for my 20 vertex model, right? And the neat thing is that because they come from three uh, different uh, six vertex models, all with the same quantum parameter Q, uh, they will also have three spectral parameters, right? Z, W, and T. So I claim that this, in the homogeneous case, where all the, uh, all the weights will be the same, not depending on their position in the grid, uh, which is the case when all the spectral parameters have the same value diagonally, vertically, and horizontally. I will be left with uh, actually four parameter family, but if you remember, my Boltzmann weights were uh, projective, right? I can always multiply them by something, and so there's always one less freedom than the number of apparent parameters. Okay, so three parameter family of, uh, of, uh, of, of Boltzmann weights, which is very nice. So here they are. So they are actually grouped by, uh, by packets, right, here. So the 20 uh, split into actually seven different v uh, vertex weights, one of which is really a sum, and you, you, can't, you can write it as a product. All the others you can write as product, but this one uh, resists, so it's a sum. Okay, so this is the, uh, you go from, the, from those parameters to, uh, to angles, which is kind of neat. And the uniform case is part of this story. It's obtained in this case. So uniform means that all the weights are going to be the same. Okay? So we can actually count the configurations this way. Okay. So now here is the, here is the, 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 the proof of the correspondence, basically. <coughs> so bear with me. You start from the triangular lattice in its Kagome form. Right? We know it's, it's defined by the Kagome, so it works. And now I'm going to pull all the diagonal lines that are below the main diagonal, right? I'm pulling them down like this. Okay, and I can do that because of Young-Baxter, right? I can cross other intersections, so I get to this situation. And then I pull up the, the rest of the guys, okay, and I get this. Okay, now I have to keep track of my boundary conditions, right? I remember, huh, this is domain wall boundary R1. Right? And now if I look carefully at all the ends that I have created by pulling all my lines, I see that the ends are always uh, going in the same direction. Two entering here, two outgoing here, two outgoing here. So whenever you have uh, two of the edges that go in the same direction, it fixes the others, right? Because of ice rule. Okay? So it means that everything is fixed inside. So look. Here, everything is fixed, fixed. So by fixed, it means that uh, of the R matrix only remains one matrix element, so it's just a number, right? So the partition function here is the partition function there times a number. And there, what do we see there? Once we have gotten rid of all those numbers, we see exactly the six vertex with domain wall boundary conditions, right? So basically, what matters here is the Q, the quantum parameter that I had here, is the quantum parameter which will characterize the square uh, six vertex model I will be have in the end. So this is at the level of partition function. Is this clear? I've just used Young-Baxter, right? For once, uh, you see that we can use it efficiently, right? Okay, so, um, but let's go back one step. Here, I told you that the uniform case was for eta equals pi over eight. Therefore, Q is, is eighth root of unity. Q squared is fourth root of unity, right? And that, uh, that means that uh, the six vertex model I get here is not the one that was playing a role for ASMs. For ASMs, it was a cubic root of unity, right? And now it's a fourth root of unity. So you see, we've changed, we've changed the model, right? Drastically. Okay, 
So here is the theorem that follows, right? So if you look carefully what being a fourth root of unity means, it just means that uh, it's the six vertex model with weight one square root of two one. So the partition function of a 20 vertex model with all weights equal to one is just that of a six vertex model with these particular weights. Okay, so the B is square root of two instead of being one, right? Okay, so this, uh, okay, so <laughs> back to Kagome. <laughs> The very interesting thing here is that on these Kagome uh, boxes, it says 20 and 6, right? <laughs> so if I had been more careful uh, the first time, I would have immediately known what, what was the thing to do, right? So it turns out this means uh, 20 fruit and 6 vegetables, I think. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So one uh, of the consequences of this is that actually uh, the 20 vertex mode of APM are enumerated by a weighted enumeration of ASM, right? Because these are the six vertex configurations, so it's also the ASM. But now I'm going to put a weight square root of two whenever the paths go straight vertically or horizontally, right? And they always go by pairs, so it's weight two here, it's weight four here, it's weight eight here. So if I add up those numbers over the seven alternating sign matrices, I get 23 again. Right? So it's my 23. So it's very good news because now I get my 23, which I wanted for size 3. And uh, we can uh, now prove a, the a complete theorem, right? Uh, and how, how does the complete theorem work? Going from here to the formula I gave you for the uh, quarter turn symmetric uh, domino tiling uh, of Aztec uh, uh, quasi square, holy square. Uh, it's by using the result, the standard result on six vertex by uh, Korepin and Isergin, uh, that the partition function is a determinant, no matter what the quantum parameter Q is, right? So you can use that. Okay, so here I'm, I'm putting under the rug uh, many, many pages of, of, of calculations, but in the end, you can prove that the two determinants are the same, okay? So that does the job. Now, uh, what I want to show you is uh, some conjectures. So here is now the domain wall boundary condition free. So you remember in terms of paths, it means uh, you know, every other path entering, every other uh, edge entering, every other edge outgoing here, right? And here is a sample configuration, and this is the sequence, 1, 3, 29. Okay, so here is the conjecture. So now, now the o OEIS has been useful, right? So, uh, and uh, uh, here is the thing, if you look at the domino tilings of a 2n by 2n square, but real square, not Aztec, huh? square, square, square. Uh, it is given by 2 to the n times bn squared, where bn is 1, 3, 29, 901. That's an old result of Temperley and Fisher. And actually for a long time people wondered why at all is there an integer hidden in this formula, right? What is this bn? And so it took a long time, uh, until 97, right? So we are talking about 30 something years, before Patcher found the proof of uh, integrality of this bn by finding just a domino tiling interpretation. And guess what? It's just half of the square. Okay, but you have to cut the square in the right way. So you do a staircase of, uh, uh, of steps of longer two, uh, of length two, right? And the, the last guy has length one, right? So, and here you see that the two pieces are the same. Okay, so you cut your square like this, and then the, the domino tilings of, of this guy uh, are, the, are, the, are counting by, by Bn. Okay, so there's a beautiful proof of... of two, two to the n is, 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 is the number of ways to like... Exactly. Okay, so this is one choice, one particular choice, but you, you essentially on the, along the diagonal you have a freedom of, uh, yeah, okay, excellent. All right, so counting these guys is easy, right? You use uh, again these Schroeder paths, right? Because it's same domino tiling, but now these are Schroeder paths under a roof, meaning uh, uh, they can't go above this line, right? So there, there's a roof that limits my Schroeder paths, okay? So again, you use Gessel VNO and you count these guys and you're very happy, you can... Uh, okay, so this is the, yeah, well, this nice... Formula for this. Is there a formula? You can write it as a determinant, but it's not particularly nice. But it's a determinant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. So that's a form. Yeah, but that's really not combinatorial, right? I, I think he meant a, a better formula than that. Well, okay. It's a formula, sure. <laughs> Do you like it? No, I don't. I don't like it. 
Oh, control integral. <laughs> you do it. It's your assignment. <laughs> you still have uh, 20 minutes, so go. So here is the conjecture. Uh, the configurations of 20 vertex domain wall boundary condition free uh, are actually uh, counted by the domino tilings of Patcher's triangle. Okay. So this is open. So go for it. Okay, now we can do a bit better. We can make a pentagonal version of that. So here is the thing. You remember I had every other guy entering here and every other guy outgoing here. And now I'm just inserting an arbitrary number of empty edges. Right? So I'm, I'm just pushing things a little bit. So the, it's very easy to see that those guys have to go straight until they hit this diagonal. Right? And so this turns into a, a pentagon of triangular ice, basically. Huh? And so the um, question is, now uh, with these two parameters, n and k, right, uh, size n and size k, uh, what, uh, what are these numbers, right? These are integers, what are they? And it turns out, uh, we conjecture, that they are given by this, by the Patcher's triangle with raised roof. Okay, so you remember I had this roof on top, which did prevented my, my path from going too high. And now I'm just raising the roof by k. Okay, and the TNK now is going to be the right number. So that's also, uh, so it's always better to have uh, more conjectures than just one, and so maybe this helps actually. Okay, any question? This is the summary of the conjecture. Any question? No? I guess it's clear. Okay. So I just want to show you uh, why it's much more difficult from the point of view of a 20 vertex model. And the reason is, is because of these arrows here. You see, these arrows here are going to make my method of before fail. Okay, because instead of having pairs of arrows pointing in the same direction, which allow to sort of undo everything, now they point in opposite directions, so they tell me nothing about the rest. So I'm stuck. So we found another way of doing than the previous case, the, the case of domain wall boundary condition one, in which the, the, the domain wall boundary condition was such that it made it easy to remove the diagonals. Huh? So if you can't remove the diagonals, just keep them. Okay? So that's what we decided to do, and to, to, to push them inside so as to form a fourth sublattice. Right? It's a kind of trivial sublattice in which the, 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 the guys don't interact. So it, it's trivial weights for this sublattice, but now this enters a category which is called uh, staggered uh, lattice models, which is a subject of study by itself, and uh, we uh, have a hope that uh, this staggered model can be studied, but that's a question. All right, now limit shape. So, uh, okay, so the Arctic phenomenon, uh, we, we've seen already examples of it, so I'm not uh, going to, uh, to explain more, just that we have to take the size very large, right? And that a typical configuration in large size is going to exhibit frozen domains. So frozen domains in the path formulation just means that uh, these paths are going to be regularly uh, filling the space, right? So there will be uh, several ways in which they can do so. And then liquid domains in which the paths are kind of disordered and do uh, random things. And here is, for instance, okay, so is this, yeah, this is quite visible. So uh, I can, all right. So this is actually the simulation of, of a path simulation for APMs, right? So domain wall boundary conditions one, right? 20 vertex model with weight one. So I'm just counting things and uh, putting them a, a, a uniform probability, right? And uh, uh, drawing some typical configuration. So you see something appearing clearly, something which looks like a, 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 a coffee bean. I call it a coffee bean, right? And what I just want to draw your attention to is the fact that there are actually six ways this thing can be, um, can be frozen. So let me zoom in here. So you see, uh, you can be frozen by just having one family of paths going uh, straight, or two families, right? Or you can also be uh, frozen by having nothing, right? That's another way. Or here, that's different families. Right, so again, the vertical ones, and now vertical and diagonal. And finally, uh, in this corner, everything is filled, 
right? So you have six uh, phases of ice, which makes it already uh, perhaps more interesting. And uh, so what we managed to do is to actually uh, compute uh, uh, the, the shape, right? Explicitly, uh, analytically. So um, to, to do so, we are using a method which is uh, not quite completely rigorous yet. I mean, not proven to be completely rigorous yet, but uh, as a physicist, I have no, no doubt. Uh, <laughs> but we'll have uh, the next talk, I think, is, is going to make this uh, much more solid. So anyway, so how does it go? Right? So uh, in general, you're going to have some, uh, some bunch of paths with attached ends like this, right? And you're looking at some uh, conf big configuration of that, right? So the idea is that all these paths have starting and ending points, right? And you want to uh, basically understand what happens to the outermost path, right? It's the one that's going to have the shape of, uh, uh, of the limit shape, okay? So to do that, you're going to use one of the uh, prisoners has probe on the others, right? So it's like a snitch somehow. He's going to tell you what's happening in there, right? So you take him away from his comrades, right? And you put it there above. And uh, you now consider this statistical model, right? Which is a bit different because one of the paths starts from uh, way above, right? And what happens is that as long as he's far away from his comrades, uh, the most likely uh, trajectory is, is going to be a line, right? So what you get is basically, uh, asymptotically, a line, right, which is tangent to whatever arctic curve the other guys were forming, okay? So if I manage to find where this point here, so this is uh, arbitrarily chosen, but it's, it's the point where this new path enters the old domain, Right? So um, actually, the position of this guy is going to be the solution of a variational principle, right? A very simple one, which in involves only the knowledge of what's in the green square. And in the green square, what is it? It's the partition function of the same thing as before, right? But now with one of the paths, the last path, starting somewhere on the, on the top horizontal border, right? So you, you fix this length here. And you can compute this partition function. You can compute the partition function for the single path up there with the weights of a 20 vertex model, of course, and not just arbitrary path, but with the right weights. So the product of these two partition functions summed over the position here is going to be uh, the object which allows you to do the uh, variational principle because you're going to look for the distances from here, the positions of these guys which maximize the contribution, okay? And that will give you a relation between this position and that uh, position up there, right? So by moving uh, this extra point along this line, right, you're going to generate a function of this distance here, which will be the position of this point, and therefore a family of lines. And the envelope of this family of lines is going to be the Arctic curve. So that's the idea. Any question? I think it's, uh, okay, so here is the answer. Uh, so, uh, so we were able to compute this uh, extra partition function with an extra path uh, starting from elsewhere, just because we have this relation to the six vertex model and such a partition function has been computed in the six vertex model. So uh, technically it just means that you need a spectral parameter in the first row that's different from the others. It's kind of a probe again, right? And so, but all I showed you was for arbitrary spectral parameters, right? So it still works. So there's, there's really a, an easy way of, of getting these things. And then you have to do the variational principle, which takes a little bit of time. The solution doesn't fit in this uh, slide. So that's why I'm not writing the solution, but showing it uh, as in a picture. So Procedural this, curve? sorry? Ah, that's a very good question. Let me just postpone the answer a little bit, so just show you what goes on. So actually, the piece of curve that we honestly compute with the uh, tangent method applied to these sets of paths is really only the piece that goes from this tangency point to that tangency point, right? 
Okay? For the rest, we have to resort to other things. We have to describe the same configuration with other families of paths and do the same, same job. So basically, you have to do the job six times, actually only three times, two times even, because of the symmetries. Right? But so you, you basically compute independently this piece and this piece and this piece and this piece, right? You compute them independently. And then I can answer your question. Are they or not the analytic continuation of each other? Right? And the answer is not in general. Okay? They are not. So these, uh, uh, there, there are some, uh, some, some non analyticity points, in fact. Yeah, I mean, I would have guessed that that was the case. Yeah. It is piecewise algebraic, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So let me show you more, uh, maybe. Ah, no, this is something else. OK. So there's one case which is interesting, which is this case, right, the, the uniform case. So in the uniform case, uh, there's a very, very neat. Uh, so, so this piece is algebraic, right? And this one is not the continuation, any continuation of this piece. Now, we can play the same game with the uh, um, uh, uh, quarter turn symmetric domino tilings of the uh, holy Aztec square. Okay? And here is the answer. So clearly it has fourfold symmetry, of course. And uh, you get this, uh, this sort of uh, clover leaf thing, right? So this is again in the uniform enumeration in which uh, you just enumerate, right? You, you put weight one to all, uh, all configurations. And this is the curve. So I, I, I didn't have place, uh, any place to put it entirely. So there's a piece here, a piece there, a piece here, and a piece there equals zero. Right? <laughs> so you can see that it has degree 10. Right? It's a degree 10 uh, algebraic curve. And uh, the curve, uh, so here in this case, of course, because it's uh, tiling, you know, with weight ones per tiles, uh, this is an algebraic curve. Right? The entire thing is an algebraic curve. So now look at this. I've put together the solution for the, uh, for the 20 vertex model and the solution for the holy Aztec square, right? And these two pieces actually are uh, exactly superimposed. That is, it's the same curve. So the curve that does uh, the analytic uh, uh, limit shape of the square uh, domino tiling of a square is actually the, the piece that's here, OK? Now, moreover, if you look at the analytic continuation, which goes down to here, and you apply a shear transformation, which brings this point here to here, right? So linear transformation, right? Then it gives you this piece. So actually, uh, it's, it's better than being just uh, analytic, uh, piecewise analytic. It's also that some pieces are, are the shear of, of, some other, of, of the analytic continuation of other pieces. So in a sense, I would say that when I look at this, it, it makes me think that this is perhaps the, uh, uh, the closest to a bijection I can be, because it's, it's more like an, uh, an, an asymptotic bijection, right? OK, I'll, I'll let you uh, just uh, think about that. And these are more, so I, I told you I have a three, three parameter family of curves, right? So we have a three parameter family of, uh, sorry, three parameter family of models. So we have a three parameter family of uh, curves. So these are examples chosen randomly. And this is the conclusion. The conclusion is that unlike uh, what people have thought for a very long time, the triangular ice is interesting. So it was kind of dismissed after uh, Baxter killed the subject by uh, showing that the free energy for this model is just the sum of free free energy for free uh, six vertex models, therefore uninteresting from his point of view. But as you can see, uh, uh, the combinatorics inside is quite interesting. So there's a question about these APM. Are they useful? Uh, uh, can one uh, define them with symmetries? There's the question about the staggered six vertex model. It's, it's really a good problem, I think. Uh, it has to be studied. Uh, there's this uh, question of Arctic phenomenon, which we basically answered for this case, but which is still uh, open for the uh, domain world boundary condition free, for instance, case. Okay. And uh, these are the two papers that uh, uh, are on the archive regarding this. Okay, thank you.